That's one of the reasons we are gathered here on this Lord's Day is because we are saved and we are on our way to heaven. And the songs that we sing lets us know sort of what it's going to be like when we get there. One of the problems that uh, uh, God's people have, when I say God's people, get in where you fit in. Uh, God's people, uh, one of the problems that they have is that of really, first of all, uh, belief. Then, of course, second of all, uh, being able to be faithful, being able to continue, being able to hold on regardless of what's happening in the world around us. And that's really what you see throughout Scripture uh, that God's people had to always deal with. They was either uh, in captivity, they had to deal with the issues of captivity. Uh, you read how they were in the desert in the middle of nowhere, not figuring out how they're going to get, how they're going to make it. Uh, but God was trying to get them to understand, I don't need you to focus on that. I need you to focus on me. Just like he gave them bread from heaven, just like he gave them water out of a rock, God can do whatever his people need if they would only believe and listen to him. And I just pray that as we uh, continue uh, on our journey that we won't lose our focus. We won't allow ourselves to be uh, lost in the end because we have took, taken our eyes off of the Lord. Uh, one of the things that we uh, also want to, or let me just make these announcements real quick. Uh, uh, I just want to make mention to you and give thanks to uh, the Bridges Ministry for the movie matinee on yesterday. Um, they watched a movie called The Shack, and in watching that, there's supposed to be some things that you can learn from that movie that can kind of help you understand why faith is important uh, in, in your life. Uh, I also want to make mention of the uh, Lads to Leaders uh, event that's going to take place in the month of April. And we are hoping uh, that our members who are interested, um, who have children, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping right now that the list holds up. Right now we got a good number of folk who say they want to go. Uh, but again, we kind of have an issue with maintaining, with staying, with something and it is my prayer that you will be giving it the thought uh the necessary thought that's needed make the necessary preparations that's needed so that uh you can make this journey because <clears throat> i believe in making the journey you and your children will come back uh the better for it and so please keep that in mind that's uh in the month of april uh if you have interest in that then you can see uh, either brother Omar Harris or Brother Brad Harris, or even Brother Scott. If you can't, if you don't know who Brad and Omar is, you can see Brother Scott. I pray you know who all who they all are. Also, last, I want to make mention to the um, West Coast Preachers Forum Committee Chairs. Please make sure that all of your committee members are aware and hopefully plan to participate. Um, at our appreciation luncheon that's going to be held on the 7th of March. That's this coming Saturday now here at the building uh, around noon. So please uh, get with your folk and make sure that they are aware and uh, hopefully you can get a commitment that they will attend the event also. Um, my uh, topic this morning is entitled Prisoners Without Bars. One of the things I'm going to uh, hope to do, that's our topic for the month, uh, is surviving Pharaoh's prison. And what I'm hoping we can do with that lesson, because, I mean, it is one that can really, that really uh, speaks to all of us. If we have an open mind, if we understand, oh, I mean, what, you might say, what does Pharaoh's prison have to do with me? Well, his prison probably has nothing to do with you. But do you understand your prison? And, and, and what we're doing in, in, in our classes, I'm, I'm trying to 
uh, uh, I gave three, I'm, I'm dealing with this prison issue from three different perspectives. Number one, yeah, we're going to look at Pharaoh's prison. We know what that's about. If you read your Bible, you know what Pharaoh's prison was about. That was where Pharaoh had God's people in captivity and all of the things that he made them do, and they had to survive. But how did they survive? See what I mean? Uh, and then as you come across uh, the annals of time, you find out that even in our time, there is prisons. When you hear the term prison, what's the first thing come to your mind? A place where there's uh, brick and mortar, fence, guards, and all of that, and you got people in there on lockdown. Isn't that right? Yeah. But uh, what God wants us to understand is to go beyond that and understand you are a prison. You can be your own prison. Uh, now, you got prison and you got prisoner. So generally, if you're in prison, you are a prisoner. And I always ask folk to ask yourself, especially with scripture. Now, I'm asking yourself uh, to put yourself in, uh, in the uh, position of this title. But also, as we're going through scripture, put yourself in scripture and ask yourself, what does it have to do with me? How does that impact me? Because just because you can't see how it impacts you don't mean it don't. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I, one of the last things, and then I get to my topic, one of the things, I, I, one of the scenarios that I try to provide, and I kind of like this one. I kind of like this because I think, I think it's easy for everybody in, in here to identify with. Uh, and if you're honest with yourself and if you can reflect, uh, maybe on your recent trip, you can probably see the truth in this um, observation. Uh, I, I, I believe I could say that the majority of the folk in here has been on a trip. Amen. When I say trip, I'm talking about in a basically either in a car. If you want to do train, I'd prefer we stay with the car. I don't think we have any horse and buggy folk in here yeah. right now, do we? So I, I would want to focus on car, okay, or even if you have to do train. Because there's, there's, another, there's another issue, and that is that of the airplane. But my goodness, you, know, you don't see nothing when you're in an airplane, do you? No, you see the, the beginning of your trip, and you see the end of your trip when you get there. But you see nothing in between. Everybody follow? Yes. Amen? Yes. Uh, let, let me just drop this while I'm here. We have folk in the church that uh, that's the way they are with their Bibles. They are airline Christians. They don't see nothing in between. They just see where they start and where they finish, and that's it. Have no idea how they got there. That's dangerous. But if you have been on a trip, would you not agree with me that, and Terry, let me just do this. Let me just do this. Let's go from here to California. How about that? That's kind of simple. I kind of think just about everybody in here has driven from Las Vegas to California. If anybody in here have not driven from, Calif from Las Vegas to California, I'll even uh, accept your trip from here to Henderson. <laughs> because my point is going to prove true regardless. I just want to make sure you have been on a trip somewhere. And this is my point. How many of you believe and can attest to the fact that uh, if you take that trip, when you take that trip for the first time, you're going to see a lot, aren't you? But wouldn't you also agree with me that there's a lot that you're not going to see? Church? Okay, I, I want us to travel this journey together because it'll make it easier for you to follow with my lesson. If you, yes, that you're going to see a whole lot. But there's going to be some things you're not going to see. Why is that? Well, because on that first trip, that wasn't your focus. Isn't that right? Imagine, this is what it looks like. You take the trip, you go from here to California, and then once you get back, you start talking to somebody, and they ask you the question, did you see such and such on the way? And you might say, well, no, I didn't see that. Well, yeah, it was down there, it was on the right-hand side, blah, blah, blah. They're explaining to you this, this whatever it is that was there, but you didn't see it, yet you went the same route. Why is that? That wasn't what you was focused on. That wasn't what you was looking for, Right? Uh, but then, let's say, if you take that trip five times from here to California. Everybody with me? 
five times, you're on your fifth trip to California. Would you say that you have seen everything on the way from here to California? No. Hopefully you won't say that. Okay. So what's your point, Brother Gay? I'm trying to get you to understand. I don't care how often you read your Bible. Always understand that there's going to be something you're not going to see. And if you don't understand why you're missing it, you could probably go all your life and never even know it is there. Sometimes, it will, you know, when you're taking a trip, other folk may say, well, okay, make sure you watch for this. Make sure you look for this. They've planted the seed, give you something to look for, right? And, oh, by the way, you may do that with some folk, too. You may tell them, hey, I go to California all the time. You need to look for this, look for that, look for that. And they may say to you, yeah, but I like such and such. And you might say, well, I didn't see that. Where is that? All I'm trying to show you is the reality of our lives that we live every day is sometimes missed when we try to look at our journey as Christians. We think we got it, we, we, we figure we, we know it, and oh, by the way, like I was telling my class this morning, for me, when I'm driving from here to Texas or wherever, there's certain places I stop every time. There's a lot of places I don't get to see, and oh, by the way, guess what? There's a lot of places I don't care to see. Everybody understand that? But I can't have that attitude when I'm in God's word. I can't make the decision that I don't need to see something that God is saying, this is what you need to be aware of. Everybody follow? So when I'm talking about throughout uh, this month, when I'm before you and I'm talking about being a prisoner, my topic is a prisoner without bars. I'm trying to make sure that we understand I can be my own prisoner. And when all is said and done, just like I lock myself in, <laughs> I can let myself out. Amen. Yeah, we want to blame other folk. We want to blame everything else. But what's my responsibility? What did I do with my imprisonment? What was my uh, uh, role did I play in my imprisonment? If I'm imprisoned because of me, then I can get out. I got to first understand, though, that I've locked myself in. Okay, I'll give you some more of that later on. Let me get to the lesson. In John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, uh, this is where we're going to be, um, let's say, trying to springboard from this morning. John chapter 8. Um, this is where Jesus is warning against unbelief. And I say to you often, uh, please understand the difference between Believing in and believing, okay, believing in God and believing God. You can believe in God, but you may not believe that God will destroy you if you disobey him, and that's because you don't want to believe that. That becomes your choice. You choose not to believe that God will do certain things. Why? Because you've convinced yourself that God is a loving God, God is kind, God is all this, but you fail to understand God is also just. Amen. And so uh, when we are reading, <clears throat> we have to make sure that we're not putting blinders on. We're, 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 we're keeping ourselves from seeing some of the things that God wants us to see. When a person does things because they want to, it's very evident that the results are much different and sometimes better than when they do things because they have to. How many of you have the feeling when you're serving God that you have to? And even though that may be true, God wants to elevate you from that position of doing it because you have to, to doing it because you want to. And you got to know why you even want to before you can do that. When a person's heart is truly after God's own heart, as David's was. They want to please him, and all they need from him is instruction, direction, and opportunity. And God provides plenty of each. When David said in Psalm 51:10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He was basically saying, free me from myself. I, I have a 
I have my way. I have uh, my thoughts. I need to be freed from that uh, because my own thoughts and ways can't free me. Matter of fact, if anything, it locks me down more. But if, if you believe that God can and will and in some cases have freed you, I know we all know of situations. You may not know of people. You may not be one of those. But you have to know uh, that there are folk in prison who like being in prison. Uh, I, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but you have, you don't, that means you don't understand the process. You don't understand what's going on. They, if they've been in prison for so long. They've been locked down in a certain situation for so long. To where when the prison gates are open and they are set free, number one, they, uh, they have been detached from society to the point to where they don't know what to expect. And oh, by the way, society don't receive them very well. Guess where their comfort is? And guess where you'll find them before long? Right back in prison. You know, when Jesus... Uh, when the Bible teaches us uh, that you've been freed from your sins. <laughs> you've been set free from your sins through baptism, obedience to God, and baptism. You've been set free. Everybody, everybody understand that? You've been set free. So just like that person in prison who has gotten comfortable Matter of fact, I say have gotten comfortable, but even that's kind of hidden because while they're in prison, guess what they're kind of wishing for? Subconsciously. Wanting to get out. Wow. Wanting to get out. And yet, when an opportunity comes for them to get out, and let's say they do get out, why would they end up back in a place that they have been Wishing and praying all along to get out of. Y'all still on board this morning, right? All I'm trying to get you to understand is as you're listening to me, think about yourself. Think about your sin. Think about your condition. If God has freed you from your past, why do you still want to hang on to your past? That was your bondage. That was your sin. That's what was holding you prison. He freed you from that. And told you how to stay free. And yet you find yourself right back in it. Why is that? Could be because that's where you feel most comfortable. I read in my Bible where the Bible says men love darkness rather than light. Well, why? Because you can do a lot of stuff in the dark that everybody else can't see. In the light, everything is exposed. Uh, the Bible lets us know Jesus is the light. He wants us to be the light. He wants us to walk in the light. But if your heart is one that is still filled with darkness, you don't feel comfortable in the light. Church, please don't miss this. You know, that's why some folk, some folk don't feel comfortable around Christians. I'm talking about real Christians. I'm talking about, I ain't talking about the Christians who who uh, tell you you shouldn't be smoking dope and they smoke dope. I'm talking about those who don't and then they're trying to tell you you shouldn't be. True Christian. In other words, you stand for who you are. Who you are can be seen in your life. You ought to be able to be comfortable regardless of who you are around. But we have Christian folk who don't feel comfortable being around other Christians. Now, let, let me just say this. Let me just drop this for you. Sometimes, depending on where I am, I don't feel comfortable around some folk who say that they are Christians. Because I see them doing stuff or hear them saying stuff that don't make me feel comfortable. And if, if I know I can't control that environment, that audience, I'd rather leave. <laughs> in other words, I have learned in scripture that God wants me to be in control of my life. 
through him, but he want me to be, in other words, when I say my life, he want me to be the one to make the decision as to who I'm going to serve. And you got folk who will say they serve God, but their lives represent the servant of Satan. And there's a reason for that. And where we are in our, in our text this morning, you're going to see Jesus is trying to help these disciples understand what their problem is. And oh, by the way, how they can resolve it. But yet by the same token, I want us to see Jesus as a prisoner. Hello? Amen. With no bars. We're going to take a quick look at Paul, if time allows, as a prisoner with no bars. And hopefully get to understand how and why we are and should be prisoners without bars. In a good way. <laughs> Hello? Uh, you, you're already prisoners without bars now. As you sit here right now, every one of us. You, you, you know what your issues are. You know, what, you know what's hard for you to let go. Okay? That means you're a prison to that. You're bound to that. You're in bond to that. Don't necessarily mean it's bad, maybe. But if it is bad, you, gotta, you ought to be, need to be aware of it so that you can change it, right? But you also want to be a prisoner with no bars, in a good way. In other words, you, you want to be able to do things, uh, do the things that you do because, number one, you not only just have the freedom to do it, but you're doing it because that's what you want to do, and you want to do it because you know that's what God wants you to do. See, a lot of folk don't have that relationship with God. They talk God. They don't have a God. They don't have a relationship with God. That's what the scripture is trying to warn us of when Jesus says, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Okay? So they're claiming him. And oh, by the way, they're going to even throw out a few suggestions. We did this. We did that. We did this in your name. And he just says right there, and I will say to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. Why? I call you Lord. I've been doing these things. Why would you say to me, depart from me? Well, because, probably because I was an airline Christian. <laughs> probably because, yeah, I always made it from point A to point B, but I never really saw anything. I missed so much in all of my time in being in the church. I have missed so much in my life by not applying it, not learning along the way, Bible says, Content, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. I just want to show you this. If I have, a, if I got to continue in this, okay, this, I'm talking about side. Look at the side, the songbook. But I'm talking about, if this is what I got to continue in, everybody with me? And I've been, I've been, I've been continuing it, I've been looking in it, or I've been in the Lord's church 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, if I'm continuing in this, they're going to come a point to where I'm going to feel like I know this. He hello? And, and, and the Bible is designed in a way to where it can teach you and grow you till you die. <laughs> you can live 100 years and still not know everything. But you can know everything you need to know to make heaven your home. So the more you learn about God and apply his, let his word uh, show in your life, the better you become and the more godly you become. And you'll get to the point where you don't mind continuing in because it, it, it's like God wants us to desire him. You know what desire means, right? mean to want badly and then he wants us to delight in his word well you know if we gave God's word the same attention that we give TV we would probably be a little bit better off
Every child of God can have a conscience of the presence of God if he will always do the things that please God. When you lose God from your conscience, from your vernacular, from your scope, you ain't got nowhere to go but toward Satan. You ain't got nowhere to go but yourself, which is why we're told in scripture to look in the perfect law of liberty and do what? <laughs> Continue therein. Amen. Now, <laughs> now somebody might say, okay, well, I, I understand that. I, I know that's talking about, he's saying if you look in the mirror and the longer you look in the mirror, the longer you'll see yourself, you see what's wrong, blah, blah, blah. And, but I mean, I can't just stand there and just continue to look in the mirror. I got to go to work. I got to go. Okay, don't miss the point now. <laughs> look at what scripture is trying to get you to understand. The principle of it. You look in, because he even says right away in that same passage, uh, if you look in the mirror and continue therein, you'll see the things that God wants you to do. But he says, but that's like a person who looks in the mirror and then walks away. And as soon as you walk away, you forget what manner of person you was. Now, God says that. We'll sit there and try to argue and justify. No, not me. I can still remember. Blah. Okay, so you're calling God a lie. He's trying to help you understand your condition. And then we have a tendency to fight back when all the time, you know, God is right. Sometimes it takes some of us a whole lifetime to recognize and to finally submit ourselves to God. But if nothing else, just know you put yourself through a lot of stuff unnecessary or needlessly because you refuse to continue in God's word. In John 8, turn your Bibles there with me. Let's, let, let's look at some of this. In John 8. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start at verse number 21. Everybody, John chapter 8, verse number 21. The Bible says, Then Jesus again said unto them, I am the way. Uh, no, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sin. Whether I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Where I go, you can't come. And he said unto them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. Is that in your Bible? So he's trying to set them in a, in a, he's trying to set them in a place where they can see their condition. In other words, he wants them to see the difference between him and them. Didn't he show that? You in the world. I'm from you. You from uh, the earth. I'm from above. You're in the world. You are of the world. I'm not of the world. There's a difference there. And if they don't believe him, ain't much going to happen. Everybody see that? He says in verse number uh, uh, 24, I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he. You shall die in your sin. Basically he's saying, doesn't matter what you do in life. If you don't believe that I am Jesus, the Christ, the son of God, and he haven't said all that to them yet, you're going to die in your sin. What if I ain't done nothing wrong? You're wrong for not believing that he's the son of God. <laughs> People go around with their statements talking about that there's good people in all churches, there's good people in the world, and you don't have to be in the church to, to be good, you don't have to be in the church to be saved. That's all man's garbage. You read none of that in God's word, and what Jesus is trying to say, I need you to believe me. I, first of all, I need you to believe that I am who I say I am, and then I need you to believe what I tell you. That's if you want a better life for yourself. If you want eternal life for yourself. That's what it boils down to. Hello? Amen. Verse 25. Then they said unto him, Who are you? <laughs> and Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. 
I, I haven't changed. <laughs> Nothing. My word ain't going to change. When I tell you something, it's going to be like that until I change it. I have many, I don't know if you ever paid much attention to 26 when you read this. I know you all have read this, which is why we're going back down this journey again. We're taking this trip again. <laughs> you've read it before. You've heard it before. But when he said in verse number 26, I have many things to say and to judge of you. You ever thought about that? I have many things to say and judge of you. The emphasis there needs to be on I have many things. Uh, because, first of all, you might say, well, Jesus was God's son. He already know. No, he's trying to, he's dealing with them at this point right now from a, okay, yeah, I'm a man. But I'm not just, not, I'm not just any man. But if I try to deal with you from the prospect or the position of just being a man. I know it ain't going to get nothing done. I have a lot of things that I can say about you. Hello? The way you are treating me and the way you are treating one another and the way you are treating God's word. He says, but that's not what I was sent here for. <laughs> Y'all didn't see that one, did you? I have many things to say of you and to uh, judge of you but he that sent me is true see how he switched it now if you're saying well he's God's son he, yes he is he's not denying that point but he's trying to help us understand there are some things that we need to understand that Jesus everything Jesus tells us everything that he did he did it because that's what the father wanted he took no credit but he is kind of letting them know here, you know, there's a whole lot of things that I can judge you and say to you. But he that sent me is true. And he goes on to say, um, and I speak the words, I speak to the world, those things which I have heard of him. Well, Jesus, if you got son, why don't you just say what's on your mind? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's in the flesh. Remember, the Bible tells us that he was tempted just as we are. If, you know, if he don't allow his humanness to come into play, it's going to be real difficult for him to, uh, let's say, understand humanness. <laughs> okay. We're at verse number 27. Look at what the Bible says. Which is why I want to pause every now and then to make sure you guys understand. And, you know, I, 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 it wouldn't be so distracting. Maybe I, I would bring, I would try to bring everybody a handkerchief. And uh, when we come across something that, you know, you really agree with and that's right, you can just wave your handkerchief. <laughs> because saying amen takes too much energy. <laughs> wave your Verse number 27, the Bible says, they understood not that he spake of the Father. Why are they not understanding? Well, because right now he's not putting nothing out there except letting them know he that sent me. Well, who is he? Who are you? <laughs> he gives them time, I guess, to kind of process what he's saying, but it seemed like they're just slow in getting it. Verse 28, then Jesus said unto them. Now remember, they just asked a simple question. Who are you? Why couldn't he just say, I am Jesus, the son of God. Now he will say that. And even when he says that, they're not going to believe it. Even after he didn't show them all kind of signs up to that point. Can you see how that can be us? These folk was following Jesus everywhere he went. And we got folk in the church who will show up at church all the time. But just because you are here, that don't mean you really understand what you're here for. Which is what we all ought to be trying to figure out. I mean, when you go to a restaurant, you go to a restaurant for what? 
Is there any other reason folk can go to a restaurant? I'm talking about, I ain't talking about those that work there and that kind of thing. That's what the restaurant wants. It wants you to come there so they can feed you and you can pay them. That's the purpose of the restaurant, isn't it? But how many of you go to a restaurant and just sit down and don't eat? Hello? (laughs) You could have stayed home and done that. But maybe you went because you were with somebody and it was good company and you had already eaten you wasn't hungry. Don't fall for the trap, y'all. I'm coming around. <laughs> there are folk who come to worship, but they're not hungry for the Lord. They're not hungry for the food that God has given. Some may come for the company. Some come out of habit. Some come out of the need to be there so folk won't be calling me, bugging me. uh, I'm here to tell you, those that's true. That's just true. Some folk would tell you that out front. Other folk, they won't tell you that, but it shows show in their lives. So remember, we're supposed to be about trying to make sure that we believe on him who God sent. And the Bible says, if we believe on him, we shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, Verse, uh, back to verse 28. Then Jesus said unto them, when you have lifted up the son of man, so you still haven't given them the, the specifics that they want yet. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that nothing, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Now, notice when He says, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, right here, He's talking about lifting Him up from the point that when you have put me on the cross and crucified me, then you're going to recognize I am he. Might be a little bit late for some folk. Now at that point, it wasn't really too late because all they had to do was repent. But but the damage in their minds is already done. But you see, we now understand that that was done for God's purpose. Yeah, man, Satan thought they won. They don't understand. No, that's what God's plan was. Why? Because nobody else could redeem mankind but his son. And so he gave his son. They mistreated him. They beat him. They crucified him. Then they killed him and thought they won. (laughs) And Jesus is telling them here, before he gets to the cross, he's saying, when you have lifted up the son of man. Now, he'd been calling himself, and this is the book of John, and, and that, that, that's a whole other lesson. Uh, you can see in the different books, Jesus is referred to by different uh, names or titles, if you will. He's the king in some, he's the son of man, you know. So here, he's, when he talks about the son of man, he's talking about himself, but they don't understand that. So he says, when you have lifted up, the son of man that everybody's going to, you know, be pointing the finger at crucify, crucify. Then you're going to know that was me. And you're going to also know these things that I've been teaching you, what I've been telling you. These are things that come from he that sent me, which is my father. So he finally mentions the father down here. Verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. That can mess him up. (laughs) He that sent me is with me. Uh, Church, again, an honest, valid question. Do you believe that the Lord is with you? He promised he would be. But, you know, it's like you taking this trip, this journey, and let's say ain't nobody in the car but you. 
do you think the Lord is with you? We say we want him to be with us, but then we probably do some things in the car that Jesus probably feel like, you can let me out at the next stop. Because we really kind of lose the focus of the idea that God is with me. If you really believe that he was with you, then you probably wouldn't do those things that displeases him when your heart is all about trying to please him. You know, we deceive ourselves. We imprison ourselves. And I just need to make sure we all understand, if we end up lost, We'll have nobody to blame but ourselves. Verse 29. Still, he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I do always those things that please who? Him, not myself. (laughs) You know, yeah, this is here for us. When we read this, we have to... We have to understand that this is the attitude the Lord wants us to have. He is our example. You got to mature to that with the attitude that you want to always please God. Always versus on Sundays or whenever I can is two different things. (laughs) And believe me, it'll show. Because even if you're always trying to please God, that don't mean you ain't going to have no problems. Jesus was always trying to please God, and look at what happened to him. (laughs) Uh, Verse 30. And as he spake these words, look at your Bible. And I don't know, I have to ask the question here because I know we got all kind of Bibles out there. And I've been reading some, and every now and then I have to go back and reread because it's like, okay, I don't think that's what that said. But it may say that in some Bibles. Uh, This is the King James Version, and what it says is, um, and as he spake these words, many believed on him. Everybody see that? Many believed on him. Anybody got a Bible that says anything different? What does yours say? Believed in him. Okay, so believing in him and believing on him is, I'm sorry, you got one that says something different? Okay. Okay. Believing in him and believing on him is in the same category. Everybody with me? And then he's going to go on to talk about believe him, which is the point I've been trying to make to you the past couple of weeks. There are a lot of folk who believe in God or believe even on God, but they don't believe God. And that's where the danger is. And Jesus is trying to help his disciples here understand it. Watch what he says. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him if you continue in my word then are you my disciples indeed you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free now that's the text as we have read it uh though there were no doubt there were folk who was among those who the lord was talking to who believed on him and there was others who may have simply just believed him To believe on the Lord is to trust him as a person. But to believe him was to accept his word as true without necessarily submitting to his will. What does that mean? That means I can say I believe God. I believe God will send me to hell if I don't do right. Everybody got that? Simple statement, isn't it? Don't need no explanation. I believe that, it's God, that God will send me to hell if I don't do right. But that don't mean I'm going to do right. Hello? You know, in James, when, the, when, when, the, when uh, James wrote, uh, you know, do you believe that there is but one God? He says, you do well. The devils believe. <laughs> the, devils know, the devil know that there is a God. But he ain't going to do right by God. He had a point now where he can't do right by God. You and I can say, I know that there's a God. I know that God will destroy me if I don't obey him. But yet I'm not strong enough to obey him. Okay. Jesus told his disciples, if you continue in my words, 
Then are you my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Which is why we are constantly trying to tell folk, study your Bible. Get in your Bible classes. Make sure you put God in the position in your life that he wants to be in. God is not going to take second place to nobody or nothing. He tells us that in scripture, even though we see it and we'll say we know it, that don't mean we're going to do it. So we're talking about making a commitment. In other words, giving yourself to the Lord the way he has required us to do. In order to become a genuine disciple, uh, one must abide in his word, live in the bounds of it, and be wholly obedient to it. True discipleship is not by profession, but by action. It is a life one lives and not simply uh, or solely a doctrine that one subscribes to. Jesus saw in these men who are said to have believed him. He saw shallowness. He saw a lack of full commitment. Did not Peter constantly talk about how he believed in the Lord? I'm with you and I will never leave you. And uh, uh, though others leave you, I will never leave you. That was Peter. Peter believed in the Lord. While the Lord was doing stuff, Peter may have believed the Lord. But the Lord did tell him. There's going to come a time that. All of you are going to leave me. So Peter heard that, but he didn't want to believe that. He locked himself behind his own thinking. I will never leave you or deny you. Then the Lord told him, what would that do to you? Well, we, we know we'll come up with our arguments. And Peter probably would have argued a lot longer too. But here he didn't. After he said that, you know, when the Lord told him, before the cock crow. Yep. All these things you said that you won't do. <laughs> Three times you're going to deny me. There's going to come a time. Your denial is going to lead you to leave me. Separate from me. No, Lord, I will never leave you. And in Peter's own mind, he really pleased, I think, and based on what all that I read, I think Peter really believed that. I say he really believed that because look at Peter's actions before truth hit. When they, when Jesus was out in the Garden of Gethsemane and those men showed up with, to arrest Jesus, the Bible tells us Peter went to work. I'm going to prove that I love the Lord. Peter takes out his sword and you got the whole army coming at him. Don't you think that don't seem, seem like he kind of believed in what he's doing? And he takes out his sword and the Bible says he cuts off one of the soldier's ears. Ain't that proof that he was willing to do anything for Jesus? Probably so in his vernacular. Probably so by worldly standards. But look at what the Lord told him. The Lord said, no, 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 <laughs> put, put that away. That's not the way we do things. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. He says, I got a different way I want you to deal with issues like this. I just want you to tell the truth. And if they kill you for telling the truth, you'll be with me. Amen. But if they kill you for lying, then you get what liars deserve. So you see how Peter had to now rethink his situation? And, and, you know, and, and Peter went on and on and on. There was a lot of times the Lord just had to keep uh, telling Peter, straightening Peter up. But we don't want to be straightened up. <laughs> the, 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 the God's word is about correction, yeah. about rebuke. Why? God knows our condition. He knows that we can't come, up at, come out of it by ourselves. We can only do it through obedience to his word. And we want people to know what God's word said so that you don't allow yourself to say, well, I ain't doing that. That's just what the brothers want. That's just what they want. To... No, 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 no. You make sure that what the brothers want is also what the Lord wants. And oh, by the way, grow to the point to where what the brothers and the Lord wants, you want also. That's what we're trying to do. Anything short of that 
is a waste of time. Because when the Lord comes back, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for those who have been faithful, committed, and obedient to his will and his way. But he saw the shallowness and the lack of a full commitment in these men. So he proceeded to make it clear to them that real, what real discipleship consisted of. And these facts are clear and often taught in the scriptures. That the faith that blesses is that which prompts its possessor to obedience. In other words, if you say you have faith, then you will obey accordingly. That's the kind of faith that God wants in his people. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Acts chapter 10 34 and 35, Peter says here, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of the truth, I perceive that God is no respect of persons. Amen. Everybody see that? That's in your Bible. Then he says, but in every nation, doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, what background you are of, in every nation, he that fear God and work righteousness is accepted by God. You know, man is the one that try to get in and separate everybody out. Uh, he'll try to do it by color, you know, by race, by uh, economics. Okay, the Bible says it doesn't matter about all of that. A rich man can go to heaven if he does what God said. Scripture says, you know, and, and I, 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 well, I, hope, I hope I haven't... Uh, well, knowingly misled somebody into thinking you can't have money, you can't be rich and be saved. I don't believe that, and I don't believe that's what Scripture teaches. I think even in that, he's trying to get you to understand, even though you got rich, you got all this money and everything you want, if you don't have Christ, you can't be saved. Now, you might say, it's not because you're rich, it's because of what your riches has done to you. You've been imprisoned by your riches. The rich man that had come to Jesus and was talking about what must I do to have eternal life? He told the Lord, I done kept all them commandments. I've been doing that since I was a child. Yeah, but you got one problem. <laughs> you got a lot of money and I know that that's where your heart truly is, is on that money. Want me to prove it? Yeah, Lord, prove it. He didn't say that. I said that. The Lord says, then sell all you have. In other words, what was your question? What do you want? Eternal life. Okay. Then what do I need to do? Sell all you have and follow me. <laughs> so what do you think was most important in the rich man's mind then? Following Jesus or keeping his money? See, God knows the heart. I always try to warn people, be careful throwing that out there as your excuse. <laughs> because you're telling the truth. And you're condemning yourself all at the same time. Yes, God knows your heart. You ought to know that he knows when you're doing stuff and you think he don't know. <laughs> you're doing things that you know that he's not okay with. So, uh, Peter... Uh, let us know that it doesn't matter. All nations, a man of any nation who will obey God will or can have or will be accepted, if you will, by God. In James chapter 2, these are familiar verses. This is where, you know, you go and you see James is the one that talked about faith without works being dead. Faith without works is being dead. Everybody ought to understand that. And that's why we in our class on Tuesdays, we're teaching on works, trying to make sure people understand uh, yes, faith without works is dead. Yes, you are saved by grace through faith in Christ. But even if you keep reading all of that, it come, and it says, and not by works, lest any man should boast. In other words, you can't come up with a work on your own to save you. Scripture says that we are God's workmanship created for his purpose in Christ unto good works. That means there's some works that God has ordained that you got to do. So don't get, don't, don't allow Satan or other people who are led by Satan to confuse you that you don't have to do nothing. Christ has done it all. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. Yes, he did. 
And he's told from that point, now he has all authority in heaven and in earth. Authority for what? To tell you what you must do to be saved. Well, I'm already saved. He already died on the cross. No. That's why God gave him the full authority to now determine how man should live. Why? He gave his life for you. So if you're not willing to submit to him, who you, who, who's left to save you? Not only that, he's, God sent his spirit to try to help us in our spirit. <laughs> uh, we got a message coming up. Matter of fact, I think it's tonight. Uh, uh, our spirit, our spirit, our sp most of us have starving spirits. Uh, we, we, we're so fleshly, we're so worldly. Um, there are some people that think just because they can get a, get a good, hot, hearty meal, everything is all right. <laughs> no, no, no. You can be well fed physically and be dead spiritually, sick spiritually. Why? You're not feeding your spirit. man. What does the spirit man need? It needs the words of the spirit. You don't feed a spirit man beans. <laughs> but God do tell you what food you do need to feed. And that's the very food that most, most folk fail to delve in, if you will. Which is why, again, man has the struggles that they have. Superficial professions. That means just claiming something, just saying something. Produced by momentary excitement in religion often influences people to offer themselves to Christ. But because of the shallowness of their faith, they are like the plant in shallow ground, having no root. We went over that a couple of months ago. They soon fall away. But Jesus taught that freedom from sin is obtainable only through the truth. The truth is what makes you free. If you want to be free from sin, you have to know the truth and obey the truth. That's what makes you free. That's Jesus' teaching. Because through truth alone, we are, a, we are able to obtain deliverance from the bondage of sin. People of the world, though they often boast about their freedom to do as they please, they are really objects of the most advanced slavery there is, being bound by their own passion, their own desires and fleshly weakness from which they are helpless to escape. You can't escape that on your own. Notice that Jesus had no desires for the pleasures of the world, but only to do the will of his father who sent him. He was a prisoner without bars. He, deserved, he desired, his desire, I'm sorry, was to please his father. And he did it without outside influences. Only children of God are truly free. If you are not free, then you have to ask yourself, why not? Uh, uh, Isaiah, you remember Isaiah 61? Uh, if, if everybody, everybody's still on board? If you're still on board, I, let me just go ahead and close with this so I can, I can quit. Isaiah 61. I just want to just put this out there. Um, we know Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 3, talks about, uh, it says that the Lord uh, has sent me, and what I want us to focus on is what our topic is for the month. And Jesus says, to set the captives free. You've read that, haven't you? Many times you've read that. You constantly read it. But how have you processed that? You read nowhere in scripture where Jesus went around letting people out of jail. Nope. Went around breaking people out of jail. <laughs> went around bonding people out of jail, paying bail. That's not what Jesus did. But when you start talking about setting the captives free, what is he trying to get us to understand? Free from your mind, free from your way of doing things to his way. That's where you get your freedom. Is in Christ. Amen. <laughs> and it's important for folk to know that. You know, he, he, when, he, when he says, what does a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's all we know is world stuff because that's what we are in, in just overwhelmed with 
until you come into the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus just simply says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But in doing so, prisoners without bars. Right now, you're probably a prisoner without bars in a bad sense, for instance. Let's say you, uh, and, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can blame it on whatever. You can call it addiction. You can call it whatever. But if you're doing something that God is not pleased with, and let, let's say, uh, I'm trying to stay away from the drinking thing because that mess folk up. Uh, uh, if you are, let me see, what can I use? Smoking too, that's, because uh, people say that, you know, alcohol is addictive, smoke is addictive. Well, don't you know sin is addictive? So you can't hide behind an addiction. So here's my point. I'm going to use smoking it. Uh, if smoking is something that you have to give up to make it to heaven, if that's what you have to give up to make it to heaven, you can't say, well, I'm, I'm addicted, I, I can't break loose, I can't, and expect God to accept that. God's not going to accept that. Yes, smoking be, can be ad addictive, so can sin. Amen. God wants you to, you to have, uh, what do you call it, um, influence over whatever it is that you claim got you in prison. If you started smoking, you can stop smoking. Yes, I hear you're going to go through some stuff, but whose fault is that? You chose to smoke. So go with the flow, go through the stuff. They call it, you get the dry heave, the heebie-jeebies, or whatever it's called. If that's what it takes for you to make it to heaven, you got to make a choice. You remember when Jesus says, when he was teaching, when he says, if your eye offend you, do what? Pluck it out. If your hand offend you, cut it off. And he goes on to say, it is better for you to enter <laughs> with no arm, no eye, than to end up in hell. Please don't miss the message. I know a lot of times we imprison ourselves, we blame our physical conditions on our attitude. <laughs> okay. But you got to understand, God is saying you need to get beyond that. Amen. You know, whatever your physical condition is, deal with that, but make sure you stay focused on eternity. That's, and oh, by the way, keep in mind, that's if you want to be with him. If that's not your desire, then press on. <laughs> press on, but just know. God is not going to change his ways just because we refuse to adapt or commit to him. God's word is settled. And until he changes it, we don't have a right to change it. Amen. If you're here this morning and you are not a member of the church that Jesus gave his life for, that he shed his blood for, that he established on the day of Pentecost and that he placed salvation in and it is the church of Christ, his church, not the four walls, his, in other words, following him. If you are not a member of that church, then you are not in a saved condition. Amen. And the way you get in that church or if that offends you, let me just give you strictly what you can see in Bible. If you are not in Christ, Oh, that's a good one there. If you are not in Christ, the dead in Christ is going to rise first when he come back. And those who are in Christ that are left alive is going to be caught up with them in the air. If you are not in Christ, that means you're out of Christ. That means you're lost. Everybody got that one? In Christ. Now, that's in your Bible. Now, watch this. In Christ means being in his body. Which is. Now, if you read your Bible, it says the church. So when people say, well, that offends folk when you say that. Okay, you just got to be offended. 
The Lord already told you if your eye offends you, you got to make a serious choice. You either pluck that rascal out or it's going to cause you to lose your soul. So brothers and sisters, family and friends, God's word is not hard to understand. Matter of fact, it's exciting when you really get into it and start following. Listen to what Jesus said and understand, understand who he's trying to help. He's not trying to help himself. He's all right. He's trying to help those who he died for who wants to be with him. And that's, our, that's your choice. If you choose to be with him, he's giving you the directions and the instructions that you must do if you want to be with him. It get, it's nothing more than that. When all is said and done. If you don't hear well done, you're in trouble. So you get in Christ by first hearing his word, by believing his word, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus to be God's son. Then be willing to be baptized, buried in water for the remission of your sins. Folk argue over baptism. <laughs> OK, but again, you have to ask yourself, do you want to listen to people? Or do you want to listen to God? Why not have a clear conscience? Do what God says. And then watch how God began to work in your life. After you are baptized, you come up a new creature in Christ. He says, now be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. If you're here and you're already a child of God, but for whatever reason, you've been locking yourself up too much. <laughs> you refuse to step out from behind that prison bars that you, that prison that you have set up. Ain't no bars there. You can stop whenever you feel like it. You can stop holding grudges whenever you feel like it. You can start loving your enemy whenever you feel like it. Why? Because you know that's the instruction that God has given. And once you do that, now you got God working in your life. And you can, you can understand now what being a prisoner without bars on the good side looks like. Just like you do stuff you want to on the bad side, God wants you to come over to the let the force be with your side. The good side. You make the decision, God will be with you on the good side. If you're here this morning, you find yourself in either condition, you need to come forth. Why not do it right now while we stand and sing the Savior's invitation song? Would you be free from the burden of sin? That's how